am involved in in different ways, but there's one mother that probably means a, a, a little bit more to me than a lot of other mothers, and that is because without her, I wouldn't be a father. So I'd like... Why don't we pray? Is that all right? Father, we thank you for this morning. God, we thank you for your word. Father, as we just um, unpack some thoughts this morning, God, and open up those beautiful pages, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you, Lord, would do what only you can do. God, that you would take my words and that you would uh, turn them into a language, God, that each one of us would understand, that would mean something to us, that we would grab a hold of something from our Heavenly Father this morning. And God, if there's anything there that's not pleasing to you or just not what it is that you would have me communicate, then let it just fall to the ground. Lord, we commit this small piece of time into your hands and we just say that we love you, we trust you, God, and we just pray bless this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. 27th of August 2014 was a, a night that, unbeknownst to me at the time, would I'd been a Christian for about, I don't know, 25 years or 20 years or something by then, but I didn't realise that God um, would use that moment in history, in my history, in my story, to reshape my walk of faith. I um, had taken a call uh, from one of my brothers. I'm the youngest of three children. I have two older brothers. And I'd taken a call from one of my brothers. And he was um, distressed, would be the absolute understatement. He, uh, for, I guess for weeks and, in fact, months leading up to that, Alan and I had had um, various bits of communication with him. And he had found himself in a really dark place. And so on the 27th, I took the call, and it was hard to make a lot of sense of what he was saying, but um, to the best of my ability, I just um, felt to speak hope, to speak purpose, to speak future, to speak love into his life. And with that, we hung up the phone, and um, off I went to bed that night and woke up on the 28th. <clears throat> and grabbed my phone as I get up early. I'm a morning person. And I got up early and I grabbed my phone and went out to put the kettle on and I noticed that there was a text uh, from my brother, the one who'd called me the night before. And this is what it said. Dearest Jackie, it has been my greatest joy to watch over you. I will love you forever. Love, Mick. And I had a feeling that something wasn't altogether right. The text didn't sound like the conversations I'd had with him the night before and um, as the day unfolded I got a call from my other brother who said, um, Jackie, Mick has taken his own life and is no longer with us. 28th of August 2014 changed my life. I, uh, in the process of talking to my other brother, he said, I'm looking for mum. And he, as you can well imagine, I'm saying it calmly today, we were not calm in the moment. Where's mum, Jackie? Do you know where mum is? And I, I need to talk to her on the phone. And mothers, you'll understand me when I say this to you, that is not news you want to hear over the phone. Amen? You do not want to be told that your son has taken his life over the phone. So I said to my brother, woo up. <laughs> I know where she is, I'm going to go find her, I will tell her, and then when I have her settled, I'll come back to you on the phone. So I went to find my mum. Now, as you can imagine, in, from driving there to getting to my mum, I spoke to Al and was like, <laughs> wow, sis, it's all happening. And, you know, I guess for probably the next 24 hours, to be really truthful, Life was just raucous. I felt like I was in a tsunami in the midst of a volcano all happening with a, a tidal wave and all manner of emotions were happening. But in the meantime, I've got my mother who's distraught, as you can imagine. I'm thinking about my own children and how's my husband going to tell them And because I was going to stay with my mum for the night. And so by, this was Friday. And so by Saturday, when I went home and I walked in the door, and of course my children were quite a bit younger then, and they greeted me and they were precious, quite obviously moved emotionally and what have you. And Al just said these words to me. He said, what, what can I do for you? What would help you right now? And I said, you know what? I just need a moment. I just need to go and I need to sit with God and I need to have time with God. I just felt so anxious, so stressed, that I just need to have a moment out. And so I went into our bedroom and I sat with God and I just said these simple words, I don't know what to do and I don't know how to cope. 
mum's messy, I'm messy, everyone's messy. And you know those brief moments, it hasn't happened to me a lot, but in this moment I felt like God very clearly spoke to my heart and he spoke to me out of a beautiful passage in scripture in Psalm 121, verse 1 to 4, and this is what it says. Have you got it? I want you to read the words and let the words wash over you. It says, I will lift up my eyes to the hills. From where comes my help? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither sleep nor slumber. That scripture has radically changed my world. It's changed when the storms of life have come, when I've been in the valleys, when I've been in the peaks. That scripture is something that is forever uh, tattooed, if you like, across my heart because I love the fact that God promises he's never asleep. It doesn't matter what time of night, what time of day, you might wake and have it all going on. You know what? You're right in the gaze of your heavenly father and he will not allow your foot to be moved. And you know, the week that preceded that, we went down to Canberra where my brother and his family were living. I, I can't even explain to you. Was I sad? Yes, incredibly sad. Uh, what, was it awful to see my kids, uh, my brother's children, sorry, walking this horror road out? Yes, it was. But you know what? There was a tangible presence in my heart that brought peace that I could only acknowledge that was God. God was being so incredibly faithful. So this morning I want to ask you a question. When life throws some stuff at you, when you are in trouble or you are under pressure, where do you run to? I can imagine for some of us, and I speak to myself here, it's easy to run to TV, to the latest Netflix series or to that favourite food, chocolate, (laughs) chips, cheese, Or maybe you're someone who just isolates from the rest of the world or you go onto that computer site that you know you probably shouldn't be. Whatever it is, where do you go when you're under pressure? Or are you one of those amazing people that you just know you run straight to God? I wish I was always that person. But I certainly have a testimony that when I did run to God, he met me in that place. I read a great meme recently. It said, what we worry about is often the area we trust God the least with. I want to talk this morning about worry versus trust. Um, As most of you who are regulars here know, I have got four children and um, I've been doing a course with some of the most amazing women in our church for the last 12 weeks called Break Free. And, um, you know, I've done that course so many times, right? And you'd think, as Al said, he's thinking two years. Well, I mean, I'm going on 30 years of being a believer. Can you believe it? God is still bringing stuff up in my life. I know that's hard for Al to believe, but he is seriously still bringing stuff up in my life and bringing the pages of that beautiful Bible to life. And so we're in week two of this course. We're about to finish tomorrow night's our last night together. So we've been um, meeting together for 12 weeks. And in week two... Um, I was heading off to work and heading down the cutting in Austinville and what I normally do when I head off to work on the early shift is I just put that time aside driving from here to work to pray for my kids. I was driving down uh, Austinville cutting and I want to preface by saying some of my kids are doing life okay at the moment. Some of them are not doing life okay at the moment And and it's weighed on my heart, particularly in the last 18 months. As I went down the um, Austinville cutting, I was saying to God, you know, da 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 And I felt like God just interrupted my thoughts. And he said, Jackie, for the last 18 months, your children have been the predominant thing you've come to me and prayed about. And I said, yes. Well, I want you to know that's idolatry. You're putting them before me. I just want you to come and spend time with me. I want you to come and seek me for who I am, not for what I can do for you. So I'm sure you can appreciate the rest of the trip was pretty quiet. And, you know, by the time I got to work, I felt really sad that I'd done that. And yet I thought that, you know, what I was doing was the right thing. I mean, I have prayed every prayer for those kids. Let me tell you, I have fasted. I've got the word of God out. I've declared it over their life. And I was somewhat shattered that uh, that I'd allowed my heart to do that, that I'd just gone to God and when I needed him to do something with my children. But what had happened was, um, 
I found that when I was doing that, I was just doing this. You know, when, when, when it seemed like God was answering my prayer, I mean, I was riding the peaks. And then something would happen and I felt like I'd be back in the valleys and anxiety would rise and, and stress would rise. So I'd run back to God and, God, can you fix this? And, God, did you know this? And, like, he doesn't know, right? But what I felt like is when I just needed to, to listen to him, he just wants me to come away and be with him for who he is, not for what he can do for me. You know, I've learned through the journey with my children that God, quite often, in fact, more often than not, God doesn't take the storm away. God doesn't pick you up out of the storm or the valley and put you straight on the peak. What I've learned and I'm still learning is he requires me to walk through the valley. Only I walk through it with him. Amen? I don't walk it alone. I wish he did remove it, but more often than not, he does it. And what I've also learned is he does this so that my roots will go down deeper in him. My dependence on him will grow. You know, I've noticed, as I'm sure you have, that the Bible often refers to stories about trees and roots. Not being an avid gardener, I thought this was really interesting. So I went and did a little bit, bit of research this week on trees and I found out the most amazing facts. Fact one, did you know that trees are, are created to need to encounter hard winds. You know, we used to have these two massive pine trees out the front of our house and I would worry when it was stormy because they were enormous. I thought the damage that they could do if they fell. And I thought of them when I was reading this fact that God made the tree so that they would actually need to encounter strong winds because what happens for them in those moments is their roots go down deeper and it keeps them solid. Did you know that not only do their roots go down deeper, but the roots go across sideways? Did you know that? Am I preaching to the converted here or am I telling you something new? Give me something. Something new? Yes. Isn't that amazing? Now, here's the interesting thing. Not only do the roots go down deeper, not only do the roots go sideways, but the roots interlock with other trees once they've experienced ongoing strong winds. Now I got to thinking, isn't that a magnificent picture of the church? You know what? You weren't created to do life alone. We were created to experience strong winds because you know what? God actually believes in us. And when we experience those strong winds, it's for the purpose of our roots will go down deeper in him, amen, but that our roots would also go sideways one to another and that together when our roots interlock with each other, we are as forced to be reckoned with. Is that not true? Is it, do you think that's the heart of God? I definitely think that's the heart of God. What a beautiful picture of the church. There's a scripture in Jeremiah 17 verse 7 to 8 that says, Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is the Lord. For he should be like a tree sorry, planted by the waters which spreads out its roots by the river and will not fear when heat comes but its leaf will be green and will not be anxious in the year of drought nor will cease from yielding fruit. You know what that passage says to me? Heat's going to come. He promises heat's going to come. If you are one of those people in this place today that Alan spoke to and prayed for this morning, that you haven't quite made that decision or perhaps you've got one foot over, I don't want to shatter your illusion, but you know what? Faith, uh, heat's going to come. It's not going to be a life that's going to be all honky-dory. There's going to be challenges. There's going to be trials. Heat's going to come. But do not fear, God says. Do not fear. You don't do it alone. There will be potentially years of drought. I feel like I have been in the valley with certain elements of my family for years. It feels like. And you know what else? God's allowed it. God has allowed it to happen. Has God left me? No, he has not. Has he forsaken me? No, he has not. But he has allowed it. Why? Because he wants my roots, roots to go down deeper, my roots to expand sideways, and my roots to interlock with my, my family, my, my faith community. Here's two things that will happen, though, when the heat comes. One, in this scripture, it's, it's, it's promised that the trees won't be anxious. Who do you think the trees are? There's a promise there. There is a promise there. If we plant by the river, who do you think the river is? God. If we plant by the river, we're being nourished, our roots are going down, the trees won't be anxious. There is no need for us to be anxious. And you know what? It will cause us to even bear fruit. So we won't be non-productive. We won't be sitting there waiting for it to all pass by. We will actually bear fruit. 
You know, my greatest times of growth in my Christian journey have been forged during some of the most challenging times and difficult storms in my life. 28th of August 2014 will always be marked in my calendar as one of the most challenging days of my life. But it's been the most, um, that one of the greatest opportunities of growth and one of my greatest testimonies of the goodness and the faithfulness of God. Church, God wants us to learn to trust him. We are, and I feel like I bang on about this all the time, but we are going into times in the future, we are in current culture now where we need to trust God. We need to know that God has a picture, that God has a plan, that he's not been dethroned. Culture and woke and all of that stuff will not dethrone God. He has a plan. I've got this great clip that I hope... Um, Luke has, I, I, I feel like it says it better than I can, that when we're praying to God and we, God, we want to we wanna trust you more, we want breakthrough, Father, we want to be those people of faith, we want to be those people who are patient, who are long-suffering, this to me testifies or says it better than I could of this is exactly what happens when we pray those prayers. Have you seen that movie, Evan Almighty? Haven't seen it? The prelude to that scene was... Um, Evan had taken a job out in another part of the States because he wanted his family to spend more time together and he'd been busy, he's a corporate man and so quality family time had been, um, negli- he'd been negligent with and so he took this job out there and when he gets there, God asks him to build an ark and I mean, that's weird, right? I almost get scared when I watch that because I feel like my husband would actually do that and so I always get a little bit anxious that, you know, will that actually happen but I mean, that was the prelude to that scene. And she, I mean, obviously, as you can imagine, the community thought he was crazy, um, as did his family. And she had packed up the children and off they went to mum's. And that was her encounter with, is it Morgan Freeman? It's Morgan Freeman. He plays the character of God. And and the essence of what he's saying there is, if you ask for something, God will provide opportunity. He, He won't just fix it. We don't, we don't worship a magician, people. We worship a living God. We don't worship a theory or an idol. We worship a living God. And so God is constantly creating opportunity for us to answer our prayer. But it will come through life. It will come through living our day to day with him. James 1 verse 2 to 4 says, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. I mean, what a challenge, right? Count it all joy. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Matthew 6. I always call Matthew 6 the worry chapter. And you know, it's the chapter I feel like God takes me to the most. But Matthew 6 verse 33 is in response to God telling us, do not worry, do not worry, do not worry. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. What will be added? Provision. Provision of our basic needs, food, clothing, shelter. He says, don't worry about that stuff. I'll look after that. But you know, it speaks to me of so much more than that. When we seek first the kingdom of God, the most beautiful need that is met is God gives you peace. God gives you peace. Worry is the enemy of peace. You cannot have one and the other. They are, it's, they are in opposition to each other. So let me ask you another question. My first question, where do you go when you're under pressure? My second question is this. Does your confession line up with your conviction? One of the things that I feel like during this Break Free course for me is God has challenged me with that question. Does my confession line up with, my, 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 with what my conviction is where my children are regarded? It is so easy to look at this level and to look at the issues and to look at the problems and to look at the strife and to look at the struggle. It is so easy to get caught in that. But I felt of like God has been calling me aside, change your picture. Because when your picture looks different, what you're looking at looks different and your confession becomes different. And so, you know, I could tell you the specifics of my prayer life, but I'm not going to do that. But what I can tell you is for each one of my children, I have lined up a photo in my mind and I have a picture of how I see them. And so when I pray for them, it's not what I'm looking at in this realm. When I pray for my children, what I'm seeing is the picture that's shifted in my mind, what I see them doing, what I feel God's purposed them to do. And you know what? It has shifted my confession. It has shifted the way I pray for them. It has shifted the level of angst that has been in my heart toward them. 
As I have consistently chosen to seek first the kingdom of God, and consistently is the key word there, consistently chosen seeking first the kingdom of God, I've been amazed at when I've taken my eyes off this because God is taking care of it, how God provides opportunities over here for me to bear fruit. The heat's going to come, the leaves are going to remain green, and you will bear fruit. So I feel like God almost encourages us if we will trust him with the stuff that weighs on our heart and get about the mission of what he's called us to do, that's where peace comes. Doing what you are called to do and worry is not one of them. Worry is definitely not one of them. I have a beautiful lady, as most of you know, I work at um, the Ramada Hotel in Ballina. And one of my favourite things to do is to check in the guests because it's like heaven from my perspective is that you have this plethora of people that you get to talk to every day, complete random strangers, and I've met the most magnificent people in that job. One of which, like just a funny thing, they came to stay and they come twice a year now and so I've kind of gotten to know them over the last however number of years. Anyway, recently uh, the lady has been diagnosed with cancer. You know what's weird? She called me at work. I mean, I'm just the chick who checks you in, darling. Takes your pre-auth and on you go and you have a lovely holiday. You know what? When she had a diagnosis, she called my work and asked to speak to me. Do you know what I think? I think that's a divine appointment. I think way back when, when she first booked into the Ramana, God had a plan and God's been working all things together for good. And it's amazing though how, I can tell you, the way that my heart's been of late, in angst, I wouldn't see those opportunities because I'm too busy looking at the ugh of life and the ugh with my children and the ugh with my husband and all that stuff. Amen? But when you shift that and leave it at its rightful place, I know it's hard to believe. <laughs> When you put those issues at any its rightful place at the foot of the cross, you see opportunities that you otherwise, I believe, would not see. I've had a wonderful opportunity sharing with this lady. I've had a wonderful opportunity to pray for her. Who is she? You know what? She's a lady I just checked in several years ago and I have a beautiful relationship with her now. As I conclude this morning, I want to leave this thought with you. I'm sure we're familiar with this amazing lady who's woven into the pages of history by the name of Kuri Ten Boom. Along with her and her family, they helped Jews escape the Nazi Holocaust during World War II. Phenomenal. She's quoted as saying this, Faith is the antidote to worry. She said, Worry does not empty tomorrow of sorrow, but it empties today of strength. How many of you know when you sit in that place of worry, it is, it's exhausting? Mentally, physically and emotionally, it's exhausting. Amen? Faith is the antidote to worry. Worry does not empty tomorrow of sorrow. There will be sorrow. There will be pressure. There will be heat. But what it does do is it empties you today of strength. You know, Alan's been talking to us for the last several weeks about the Holy Spirit. And I have just loved, I've loved it. I've been picking up that book, I'm telling you, and I'm finding him in a whole new light as I flick through those pages. I've always hated when people preach about the Holy Spirit and it's like this weird mystical presence. When I, where, what I do love is I think the Holy Spirit's role on the earth is to point us and lead us back to the Father. That's what he's here for. So I've been loving these last couple of weeks and you might remember if you were here last week that he spoke about quenching the Holy Spirit and what that means and that's a real buzzword around church community, quenching the Holy Spirit, blocking the Holy Spirit. But he spoke in detail about how, how, how we do that, how, what, how does that actually take place and he spoke about the fact that we quench the work of the Holy Spirit when we quench what he wants to do within us. The Holy Spirit is with us always. He's the part of the Godhead that will never leave nor forsake us. He is here now and he'll be with you when you walk out the door. And his constant mission is to constantly bring us back to Jesus. When we worry, when we choose worry over trust, we invariably quench the Holy Spirit within us. When we choose worry, we invariably quench the Holy Spirit within us. So let me say again, my brethren... Count it all joy that when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. So let me ask you again, where do you go when you are under, in trouble or under pressure? Do you run to your father? 
Do you run to the foot of the cross? The only, only stable in today's world is the cross. Your heavenly father loves you. Your heavenly father is for you. Your heavenly father never slumbers. Let me tell you, if you wake in the middle of the night, you are in his gaze. He has not shifted his focus from you. Isn't that beautiful? So where do you run to when you're in trouble or under pressure? Let's pray. Father, we, we just love you, God. We just love your incredible commitment to us, Father. But most of all, God, what I love about you is you just want to hang with your creation. God, your sole desire, Father, is that we would have connection and relationship with you, that you care about the big things and the little things and everything in between. Father, I pray for every person in this building this morning. Lord, for every story that's represented here, God, for every journey. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would indeed take us through the various situations, Lord. I pray, God, that for each one that our roots, Father, would go down deep. Lord, that our roots would, would grow and would be found and a solid, Father, in you. God, I pray that for every heart here that you would encourage us, Lord, that along the way you are with us, you are beside us, you have gone ahead, Father, you're around behind. Lord, that we don't face or, tr or travel through anything alone. And Father, for this morning I pray over every woman in this building, God, that your, your grace, your grace would be sufficient, your unconditional love would be all about them, God. And that this morning, Father, as we share in morning tea and fellowship together, God, let it be an opportunity, Father, where we um, allow our roots to go sideways and to, to be strengthened by interlocking with each other. Father, I thank you for this beautiful faith community. I pray, grow us, Lord. Give us opportunities, Father, to share the beautiful message of Jesus with those that we encounter this week. God, help us to see those opportunities as they, as they present in front of us. Father, I pray over every uh, child, every young person, every young adult, God, that would be part of this community, Father, that they would continue to encounter Jesus in a very real way. Father, I especially pray for those that are wayward, those, God, that have walked away, those, Father, that are just not sure. Lord Jesus, would you meet them in that place? Holy Spirit, would you reveal Jesus to them? Lord, I pray that they would know that they are seen, that they are loved, and that you have a purpose for each of their lives. And Father, I ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Church, be blessed. I am involved in, in different ways, but there's one mother that probably means a, a, a little bit more to me than a lot of other mothers, and that is because without her, I wouldn't be a father. So I'd like to.